In the month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army's 8th Air Force is established in Savannah, Georgia. It has seven men and no planes. Less than a year later, it is tasked with defeating the most powerful air force in the world, the German Luftwaffe. 26,000 8th Air Force men will die, more than the U.S. Marines lost in all of World War II. Viewer discretion is advised. Our American planes of the 8th Air Force bombed and fought off opposition in the air. They shot their way into Germany, and they shot their way out again. morning of June 6, 1944, a quarter of a million men packed inside 5,000 ships filled the English Channel. It is the greatest amphibious force ever assembled, the opening thrust in the battle to topple Hitler's fortress Europe. But as the Allied troops close in on the Normandy landing beaches, they have no idea that their fate rests on the outcome of a war fought 25,000 feet above the earth. For more than a year, the American 8th Air Force has been locked in a vicious struggle to destroy the vaunted German Luftwaffe and ensure that hundreds, if not thousands, of enemy planes cannot attack and devastate the fleet on D-Day. Although fought during the light of day, few know the details and the true sacrifices of this battle for aerial supremacy. Only now, as the invasion unfolds, all eyes look towards the skies. Their success, and with them the hopes of millions, depends upon the air war. Until now, I've never really thought about my own death. I'm still trying to figure out what happened. We were hit. That I do know. 24-year-old Andy Rooney of Albany, New York, is returning to England on board the damaged B-17 Banshee. After just six months of operations, the 8th Air Force is suffering terribly at the hands of the Luftwaffe.
There's a hole in Banshee's nose, bigger than my entire fist. Next to me, our navigator is slumped over. I think he might be unconscious. I wasn't trained for something like this. I'm just a reporter. Everything on the plane is shaking. I think I'm going to be sick. Looking down at those damaged planes, it's tough to tell how successful we've been. Or if we've even been successful at all. I don't even want to think about the men inside. God, I hope that's not going to be us when we land. It was a nervous experience to be assigned to, be assigned to go, into, to Germany go with into Germany with one of the bombers. I was nervous. I was afraid of getting killed. As a reporter for the GI newspaper Stars and Stripes, Rooney has been assigned to cover the air war in England. Today marks the first time the press has been allowed to accompany 8th Air Force crews on combat missions. When I went on a raid, I thought about my friends back home, my parents. I was very aware how dangerous it was. I didn't like it. I mean, I was, I was afraid. And, uh, but I knew that I was writing these stories by the same young men who were flying. And if they were doing it, I should do it. That's how I felt. I'm one of the fortunate ones. Of the 59 B-17 bombers that went out, five were shot down. Three B-24 Liberators were also lost. In all, 80 men are gone. Inside the hospital, those lucky enough to survive are being treated for the worst kind of wounds. The smell of burnt flesh hangs in the air. The sight is almost too unbearable to look at. I run into a couple of guys that I know who had just gotten back. Usually after a mission, we get together and talk about things. But this time, None of them says a word to me. A couple hours later, I find out that their top turret gunner had his right arm blown off at the shoulder during the mission. He was losing so much blood, they knew there was no way he'd survive the whole trip back. So they wrapped him up in a parachute and threw him out of the B-17 in hopes that the Germans would find him and give him some medical attention. But they all know how slim his chances really are. It's a horrible, sobering moment. If this is the kind of hell our boys are taking from just hitting the coast of Germany, God only knows what will happen to them when we start flying deep into the Reich. By February of 1943, the 8th Air Force has been launching primarily short, shallow missions for just six months. Already, Nearly two-thirds of their airmen have been killed, wounded, or captured. But with all of continental Europe under Hitler's control, Allied Air Forces are the only military branch capable of striking inside his heavily defended walls. If they are to prepare the way for D-Day, 8th Air Force commanders have no choice but to replenish their exhausted force 
and continue the air war. The only question is can they keep their men alive long enough to succeed? four new bombardment groups arrive in England. Among them is the 100th, a group known stateside for its out-of-control, arrogant hotshots. To think that damn CO back in the state said we were nothing but a bunch of screw-ups. God, I wish I could see his face now. Me and my buddy Griffin. We've been together since bombardier training in the States. Now that we're over here, all we can talk about is finally taking it to the Germans. 27-year-old Joe Armanini is a former college football star from Santa Cruz, California. Assigned to a 25-mission tour as a bombardier for the 100th, Armanini's fallen hard for dreams of Air Force glamour, as well as their newest superweapon, the B-17 Flying Fortress. When I saw the B-17, I thought, God, you know, 10 guns, you're indestructible. And this thing looked splendid, as I can say. It was just splendid. Uh, the one I, the first plane I had was all silver because they hadn't painted the camouflage on it yet. And it looked so like a, like a guiding light almost. It just shine, the sunshine would shine off the, off the aluminum and it looked great. Our bomber is named El Pistafo, which is pretty much how we plan on making Hitler feel. Being the bombardier is an honor. I mean, the whole point in going out is to hit the target. And with these Norden bomb sites, that is definitely not a problem. Hell, we can drop a couple tons straight into a pickle barrel. They're so damn precise. Like Armanini, U.S. Army Air Force commanders are enamored with their high-tech weapon. They believe they can use the B-17s to cripple the Luftwaffe through a campaign of daytime precision bombing. Although daytime flying puts the bombers at greater risk of Luftwaffe attacks, they are confident the heavily armed B-17s do not need long-range fighter protection. They believe the only reason they've taken heavy losses so far is because they haven't had enough bombers to attack in overwhelming force. But with the arrival of these new groups, they feel they finally have the numbers they need. Seems like all we do is train. Every day, the same thing, over and over again. Rumor has it, though, that's all about to change. And we're gonna head out for real any day now. In less than a week, Joe Armanini and the men of the 100th will take part in a six-day-long combined Allied assault called Blitz Week. More than 1,000 American and British heavy bombers will target German aircraft factories and industrial facilities deeper inside the Reich than they have ever flown before. The U.S. 8th Air Force will bomb by day, while Britain's Bomber Command strikes under the protective cover of night. Together, they will bring Germany under a relentless reign of destruction and begin to pave the way for the D-Day Normandy invasion. No one likes to show it, but of course all us guys are a little on edge. We haven't even fired any bullets yet. Let them train. On our final practice run, everyone's wondering what it'll be like to actually fly into Nazi territory. My buddy Griffith, he says he heard that if the Germans shoot your plane up and you have to bail out, the Krauts will blow holes through your chutes. Shoot it up so good you won't even have a chance of making it to the ground alive. But what the hell, I tell him. I'm not so worried about the Germans. I figure we can handle anything the Nazis throw our way. 
Be one hell of a ride, though, that's for sure. The sun's just come up, and we're already rushing around, getting ready. Seems a little crazy, but I'm actually kind of excited. I think we're all kind of excited. One thing about being young is the fact you're not afraid. You're not think, thinking of dying. That doesn't even occur to you when you're young. You do all these various things, that, and, and you think, well, you're immune from death, more or less. That's what you really think about when you're young. And, Old people don't fly. Old people sit on the ground. Young people fly and die, and that's the way life is all about. On the morning of July 25th, 1943, bombardier Joe Armanini is preparing to fly his first mission into Germany as part of the Blitzkrieg Offensive. Their objective is to destroy German military installations and Luftwaffe production facilities in preparation for the D-Day invasion. Armanini and the 100th Bombardment Group will fly to Warnemunde, Germany. The thousand-mile round trip will put them in enemy skies for nearly four hours, in full view of Luftwaffe fighters and ground defenses. Right as we're about to take off, I see Griffith getting into his plane. I wished him good luck, and he said, I'll see you at the bar. I don't think either of us can really believe it. All the training is finally over. We're really going to hit Germany. As Armanini and the rest of the 263 bombers circle into formation, the airmen face their first enemy. At 12,000 feet, the air is dangerously thin, and the B-17s are not pressurized. Men must rely on oxygen masks to breathe. Inhaling the thin air can lead to brain damage, or even death. At 25,000 feet, the forts reach their cruising altitude. Temperatures drop as low as 50 below zero. Exposed skin freezes to metal on contact. Saliva or vomit turns to ice, clogging oxygen tubes and suffocating men. For the airmen, these are routine conditions. We've been up here for hours. And the closer we get to the target, the worse the visibility gets. Bassett and Reed are pitching back and forth on the interphone about the cloud cover and the wind speed. It's always about the damn weather. Outside of Warna Monday, the weather takes a turn for the worse. Heavy cloud cover makes visible bombing impossible and puts the bombers at risk of mid-air collisions. They have no choice but to change course. Warna Monday is spared. The group proceeds to their secondary target, the city of Kiel, 150 miles to the west. The change will lengthen their mission, allowing German defenses additional time to locate. 
longer the bombers are in enemy skies, the less their chances for survival. As Armanini and the bombers close in on Kiel, their protective P-47 Thunderbolt escorts reach their maximum fuel range and are forced to turn back. From here on, the bombers must go it alone. It's a little chilling to watch them just fall away like that. There ain't nothing we can do about it. All we can do now is just sit tight and get this damn thing over with. For the past two hours, German ground defenses have been tracking the B-17s by way of a new technology, radar. Luftwaffe flak gunners prepare to fire shrapnel-filled projectiles set to explode at the bomber's altitude and rip the planes, as well as the airmen, to shreds. Spotters on the ground already have them in their sights. reach a predetermined landmark called the initial point. Here, Armanini's B-17 makes its final course change and locks in on a straight path to the target. The rest of the bombers fall in behind. Pilot William Veal shifts to autopilot and places control of the B-17 in the hands of Joe Armanini. Hunched over his bomb site, Armanini has just eight minutes to lock in on the target. As the lead bomber, every other bomber in the formation will drop on Armanini's cue. If he misses, they all miss. The flak's getting thicker, but we can't deviate from the course. If we're gonna hit the target, we have to hold straight and level and just take whatever the crowds throw at us. I can hear distress calls coming in from other bombers. One of them is Griffith's plane. Pilots saying they've been hit. My God, just a couple hours ago, we were sitting on the tarmac wondering about what the Germans would do to us. And now we know. They'll kill you. They'll kill you deader than hell. One thing about the war is the fact that there is no future. It's all the present. That's what you're thinking about the whole time. Are you going to survive? You don't even know when the war's gonna end. You're hoping it'll end, you know, quickly. There's no future for you there. There's just this present, and the present is not always pleasant. Hoping that you'll survive another day, another mission. Twenty-five thousand feet above Kiel, Germany, Joe Armanini is hunched over the bomb site inside the nose of his B-17. Inside the flak field, exploding shrapnel is tearing the bombers to pieces. Moments earlier, Armanini watched as a burst struck his best friend's plane. Now, directly below his bomb site lies the target they have come so far to destroy.
bombs are away. Nobody even says a word. We hit them dead on. But there's really nothing to celebrate. What's the point? All around us, our bombers are ripped to shreds. It's a pathetic sight. And we need to get the hell out of here. Armanini and the B-17s clear the flak field and set a course to rendezvous with a group of P-47 Thunderbolts. Until they reach their protective fighters, the damaged bombers are at the mercy of the Luftwaffe. Like sharks circling a wounded prey, this is their favorite time to attack. Escorting the bombers into enemy airspace is one thing. Rendezvousing with them on the return trip, that's another. How many will return from the mission intact? Will they be damaged? Will there be wounded on board? Will the Luftwaffe be riding hot behind them? We never know what to expect. Nicknamed the Greek by his fellow airmen, 23-year-old Second Lieutenant Steve Paisanos is behind the controls of his P-47 Thunderbolt. A pilot in the 4th Fighter Group, his orders are to pick up the wounded bombers and escort them back to England. As we were approaching the returning bombers, the Germans kept attacking. I saw one of the B-17s, uh, one of the engines began to smoke. And the next thing was that people were jumping from that crippled B-17. All of a sudden, ME-109 dove down from the sky above us and went after one of the guys in a parachute. And we were able to really witness the killing of that man coming down in a parachute. Then oh, one of our guys on the formation says, get that SOB. Dog fighting at 500 miles an hour, Pisanos and the 4th Fighter Group take evasive maneuvers to protect the bombers. I still remember how things happen in a dogfight. The sound of uh, the engines and the, where you were able to see aircraft burning and falling down. People jumping from the, their aircraft in a parachute. To this day, I go back, you know, and think about that situation. It's a big mix up there with aircraft going all over the sky. Uh, people trying to shoot each other and you are uh, watching what is happening. You know, your heart is pounding, and you see bullets flying in front of you there and try to avoid being hit, and it is really a condition that uh, I have never forgotten. The aerial duel is over within minutes. Paisano and the 4th destroyed nine enemy aircraft before forcing the Luftwaffe to retreat. With the skies now clear, they escort the weary bombers back to the English coast, where the groups split apart and return to their separate bases. I can't believe we made it back. It's such an intense rush of relief. The feeling wears off pretty quickly when I ask about Griffith's plane. No one knows anything. No one is sure what happened. But if a plane doesn't return within a couple hours, you know it's never going to return. I can't imagine what the Griffith family might be doing right now. Thousands of miles away, they have no idea that their son may be dead or dying right now. 
What will his parents do when the telegram comes saying he's missing in action? God, what would anyone say to my own family if they got the news that I was missing? The waiting. The not knowing whether you're alive or dead. I think it has to be better to be told your son has just died. And that's it. No matter what you do, you go to the bar and get drunk. Yeah, that's what happens. I mean, my relief was the fact that I know the person was gone, my best friend was gone, and all I could think of, what the hell, you know, just go to the bar and down a bunch of scotch, and, and then you go to bed, you don't worry about it anymore. And then you worry again the next morning or the next day, and you worry the rest of your life, because you, you know that the inevitable, you're never going to see him again. That's one of the facts of life. London is an embattled city. German bombs have destroyed much of it. Here, the war is personal. We have an office in the London, London Times, Times building. building. We were down in, in what was known as the city at the end of Fleet Street. You could see the devastation everywhere. No place that hadn't been hit or bombed. And uh, it, was, it was disturbing. All you have to do is take one look at the men and the women in the street. Mothers and wives who have lost loved ones, whose families and homes have been destroyed. And you can understand how passionately they hate Hitler. The attitude here is that the Germans started the war. And nothing that can happen to them is bad enough. On July 27th, 1943, US and British forces enter the third day of the combined Blitzkrieg offensive. Their objective is to cripple the Luftwaffe by bombing military and industrial sites deep inside of Germany. Only tonight, as 700 Royal Air Force bombers depart from bases across England, their mission is to destroy more than just military installations. Each plane is armed with almost 3,000 pounds of incendiary bombs. Their primary target? is the German people. The British bombers pound Germany's second largest city, igniting the first man-made firestorm in history. Hamburg burns for days. Relief workers are finally able to enter the city on August 2nd. They find streets and air raid shelters filled with charred corpses. For the British, who had suffered for years under Luftwaffe bombs, Hamburg is considered a resounding victory. Its total annihilation meant to break the will of the German people and bring the war to their doorstep. At the beginning of the war, you're innocent. You're stupid. You think it's going to be a romantic deal. You know, you're going to fly over and you're going to drop your bombs and you get the target. It's sort of like a romantic thing you see in the movies. But you change after a while. When the British bombed Hamburg, I, I, I thought it was great. They killed 35,000 people. I said, well, that's 35,000 people. That's what we have to worry about. 
there's a feeling when, during the war that takes place, whether it's secretly or unknown with you, but it's this. You know that if you kill more Germans, you kill them all, the war's gonna end. You know that's impossible, that you can't kill them all, but you kill as many as you can. The war is not a sympathetic, sympathetic war. war. I know a lot of people die when we drop our bombs. Might be children, fathers, mothers, and grandmothers. But you don't think about it that way. All we're thinking is if killing means winning and winning means going home, well then, that's what you do. By the end of Blitz Week, 8th Air Force casualties total nearly 1,000 men. 97 B-17s have failed to return. Countless others crash land in the English countryside, where reporter Andy Rooney surveys the carnage. It's difficult to get accurate stats on our losses. No one is interested in letting the Germans know how effective their flak and fighters are. But looking around, at so many smashed and damaged bombers, we all know. For 8th Air Force commanders, Blitz Week is a grim awakening. The B-17s cannot protect themselves against the Luftwaffe. They need fighter protection all the way to and from the target. But this poses a grave problem. No fighters capable of matching the B-17's range currently exists. And with the D-Day invasion looming, they cannot afford to stop hitting strategic targets deep inside the Reich. It is an impossible dilemma. Good evening, everyone. My wire is open for any late word Washington may have on the latest Nazi plane. When news of Blitz Week reaches the White House, U.S. leaders are shocked by the tremendous losses. Intelligence reports also indicate that the Germans are already rebuilding at an alarming pace. Within weeks, nearly every target hit during Blitz Week is restored to near full capacity. President Franklin Roosevelt is outraged. He sends word to England, pressuring his already shaken commanders. They cannot take such extreme losses with such minimal gains. If they are going to continue daylight operations, then they must find a way to make the impossible possible. In the face of the disastrous Blitzkrieg offensive, top American leaders are growing critical of the 8th Air Force. President Roosevelt is considering abandoning daylight bombing and forcing the 8th to join the British on nighttime missions. But with D-Day less than 10 months away, 
Eighth Air Force commanders still firmly believe that daytime precision bombing is the most effective way to destroy the Luftwaffe. Under intense pressure, they develop a new plan, one they hope will protect the bombers while proving that precision bombing does work. Looks like something big is about to happen. The ground crews are hauling out the Tokyo tanks. That can only mean one thing. We're in for a real long one. Joe Armanini and the men from the 100th Bombardment Group have spent the past two weeks resting and recovering for Blitz Week. Now, it's time to get back into action. Their mission is a dual strike that will send 376 bombers further into German airspace than ever before. Their targets are vital industrial choke points that, if knocked out, will deal a heavy blow to the German war machine. The plan is for two forces to fly similar courses as if they are heading for the same target. Once inside Germany, they will split apart, dividing the enemy's defenses so that each group will face only half of the Luftwaffe's fighters. The first strike force will hit a massive complex of ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt before looping around and returning to England. Armanini and the second strike force will continue on to a Messerschmitt assembly plant in Regensburg. After hitting the plant, they will escape across the Austrian Alps, heading down to bases in North Africa. We're all suited up and ready to go. But the damn mist is so thick, we can't even see the end of the runway. There's no way we can take off in this suit. We'll be all smashed up as soon as we get into the air. At Thorpe Abbott's, Armanini and the Regensburg group wait on the tarmac. A heavy English mist makes takeoff impossible. Ninety miles away, at Polbrook, Conditions are the same for the Schweinfurt force. Both groups are ordered to delay their departure. Nothing is worse than waiting. Sitting around with nothing but thoughts running through your head. Worrying about what might happen. Hell, I'd rather just get it over with. They just make up their minds and either send us or let us go back to the hut. God, I could use a good shot of whiskey already. As the Regensburg and Schweinfurt forces wait on the runways, it is uncertain when the heavy fog will lift and provide a window long enough to launch all of the 376 bombers. Timing between the group's departures is critical. In order to split the enemy's defenses, the two forces must take off within minutes of each other. If they don't, the Germans will have plenty of time to refuel, rearm, and attack both groups with full force. After more than two hours of delays, air commanders are forced to make a decision. They must send the Regensburg group now. Otherwise, it won't make it to North Africa before dark, and almost none of their pilots are experienced in nighttime landings. Armanini and the Regensburg force lift off into the overcast skies and set a course for Germany. As they break through the cloud cover and head over the English Channel, they don't know that the Schweinfurt group is still being held on the runway. It will be another three and a half hours before the Schweinfurt group takes off. By the time they depart, 
the dual raid is already doomed. The critical timing has been compromised. As Armanini and the Regensburg force close in on Germany, they have no idea that the plan has been shattered and that both forces will face the full might of the Luftwaffe. Seven and a half hours after departing from England, the Schweinfurt leg of the dual raid is limping back to base. Among those anxiously waiting for them is Stars and Stripes reporter Andy Rooney. I'll be damned. Here they come. We can see tiny specks heading our way. My God. I can only imagine what they've been through. Frantic calls are coming in from the pilot of 1B-17. Their ball turret gunner is trapped in the plastic bubble hanging beneath the bomber. The gears that rotate the ball and enable him to climb out and back up into the aircraft have been hit and are jammed. He's trapped inside the plastic cage. Two of their engines are damaged. 3,000 pounds of dead weight just hanging from the wings, dragging them even further down. Their gas tanks are empty, and their electrical and hydraulic systems are shot full of holes. Without the electrical system, they can't bring the wheels down. If they make it at all, they'll have to crash land, belly first. The ball turret gunner knows as we all do what comes down first when there are no wheels. He will be crushed between the concrete of the runway and the belly of the bomber. And there is nothing any of us can do about it. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor 
a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. I returned to London, shaken, and unable to write the most dramatic, most gruesome, the most heart-wrenching story I had ever witnessed. Some reporter. targets in southern Germany. Large forces of American bombers were out again today, pounding Europe into shape for invasion. Our American planes of the 8th Air Force have played a great role. The Red Army has captured seven settlements in the Smolensk area. American planes have battered a Jap bases through... Another command performance for that lovely sweater girl, Judy Garland. From the sounds of the news reports, this war might be over before I even get into it. According to this article called, I Saw Regensburg Destroyed, the 8th Air Force over in England just knocked out 30% of Germany's fighter production by hitting one city. Damn, that is a heck of a lot. It sounds like we might be training for nothing. Although right now, all we're really doing is just kind of killing time. One afternoon, I run into this gorgeous girl. Her name is Dorothy. She is just a doll to be around. All it takes is a couple of dates, and I am completely infatuated with her. 23-year-old John Gibbons of St. Mary's, Kansas, is stationed at Mitchell Airfield in Milwaukee, awaiting delivery of a brand new Douglas C-54 transport. His orders are to fly to China and deliver supplies to U.S. troops. So far, his only real connection to the war is through newspapers and radio reports. The papers were fairly favorable at uh, what was going on. The person that wrote the article, the mission to Regensburg, said they were very successful. People were fairly confident. They didn't know. They didn't know. ...the German Air Force in its production centers, on its aerodromes and in the air. We, the RAF and the United States Air Force, will keep the German Air Raid Warning Service on a 24-hour basis. We'll send over so many planes that the German anti-aircraft gunners will be beating their heads on the concrete. I wouldn't want to be a German in Germany this summer. There will be no future in it. The biggest air battle cost 307 planes. What a bunch of crap that was. That's not true. We lost uh, 72 B-17 bombers in that mission to Regensburg. We claim to have shot down 307 German planes, which is not true. It, it can't be possible. Aerial gunnery is the most difficult thing from a B-17 to a fighter. They're coming at almost 450 miles to 500 miles an hour, and you're shooting at a at a moving target that's almost impossible to hit. You're just lucky if you do hit them. <laughs> it's just ri ridiculous, that's all. Some of the claims we made, I know they're, they're, they're done for the public. That's what they're really done for. And that's the part of the, 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 the charm of the thing, because we're lying so well and uh, doing all these great things, uh, which is not true. The truth is that the only victory of the Regensburg-Schweinfurt mission is had by the 8th Air Force Public Relations Office, 
which falsely reports that the targets have been wiped off the map. In reality, nearly one-third of the bombs missed the targets at Schweinfurt. At Regensburg, the bombing is accurate, but the Messerschmitt plant is quickly rebuilt. Also underreported are the horrific losses sustained by American crews. When Joe Armanini returns to England, he learns 60 bombers are missing and another 100 permanently disabled. In just one day, nearly 40% of the 8th Air Force's entire fighting force has been crippled or destroyed. There's an element of luck in this whole thing, that's you know? That's, that's, that's what, what it is. is. Just luck. luck. Nothing else but luck. The war became a, a thing of horror as far as we were concerned. Because all we could think about is tragedy. That's all you heard. People dying, and that's the thing that you, know, you had enough of it. By the summer of 1943, Hitler's Luftwaffe boasts more than 1,000 fighter aces. Several have confirmed kills of over 20 Allied bombers. But despite their vaunted reputation, German pilots are being pushed to the limit. With a fly to die policy, they rack up tremendous kill numbers only by flying at an exhausting pace. Although they destroy 60 U.S. bombers during the Regensburg-Schweinfurt mission, Hitler is furious that his fighters could not stop the 8th from penetrating so deeply into Germany. The day after the raid, the despairing Luftwaffe chief of staff puts a bullet through his brain. The air war is taking a toll on both sides. God, I feel like I'm gonna be sick. Our orders just came through. The C-54s aren't coming after all. Instead, we're to pick up B-17s and head over to England to join the war there. I'm not sure how to tell Dorothy. It's hard to even talk about the future when neither one of us has any idea what might happen. But I got no choice. I tell her I've been transferred. Tell her I'll correspond with her. And ask if she'll write letters to me in return. Be return. I didn't know really what was going to happen. Everywhere I look, I see Americans. It's almost as if England itself has been invaded. You don't have to be a German spy to realize an invasion's coming. There's never a time where I don't think, think we were, were going to win the war. We had uh, great forces, we had a lot of them, and we had the Air Force. I never had the feeling that we couldn't win this war. I had the feeling I might get killed during it, but I never felt we'd lose. By November 1943, men, munitions, and equipment are streaming into England at an accelerated pace. The Normandy invasion is less than seven months away, and preparations are already in full swing. But as hundreds of thousands of men trained for the most complicated amphibious invasion ever attempted, 8th Air Force leaders know they are still missing one essential element for success. They have yet to win control of the skies over Northern Europe. Without it, 
the fate of the entire D-Day operation now remains in jeopardy. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Our turn to show the Germans what we're really capable of. We can finally do what we're really meant for. Attack and go in for the kill. In January of 1944, Steve Paisanos and the 4th Fighter Group are following a drastically different set of orders. Lieutenant General James Doolittle has taken over as commander of the 8th, and he has brought with him an aggressive new attitude. To Doolittle, using the fighters primarily as protection for the bombers is an ineffective waste. Fighters are offensive weapons, meant to hunt down the enemy. He cuts them loose against the Luftwaffe, telling them if it moves, flies, or supports the German war effort, kill it. That same month, Paisanos and the 4th begin receiving a brand new aircraft, the P-51 Mustang. Equipped with a powerful Rolls-Royce engine and twin 75-gallon drop tanks, it is the long-range protection the bomber boys have dreamt about. Only under Doolittle's new orders, the Mustang quickly shows its value as a killer. When you're chasing an enemy in the sky, it's like being in an entirely different world. Your opponent will maneuver violently, desperately trying to shake you off his tail. Once you're really in a position for the kill, you, you begin, begin to tremble. tremble. Your mouth. mouth becomes dry. You begin to perspire. When you fire your guns, you know, and knowing that you are going to kill someone now, uh, it's a different, uh, different feeling. It's not until it's all over that there's even time to think about what just happened. But then it really dawns on me. I've just killed another human being. For 8th Air Force commanders, the Mustang provides a glimmer of hope in an otherwise hopeless situation. In February of 1944, with D-Day just four months away, American air commanders are growing increasingly desperate to defeat the Luftwaffe. They prepare to launch six days of back-to-back -back strikes deep into the Reich. Only unlike the previous year's Blitzkrieg, this effort will not focus on bombing the Luftwaffe into submission. Instead, Big Week will employ a desperate new strategy. This time, the bombers will be used as bait to lure the Germans into the skies so the American fighters can slaughter them. Unknown to the bomber boys, the plan to destroy the Luftwaffe is now nothing more than a bloody battle of aerial attrition. This is it, my 25th mission. God, I wonder what Griffith would say if he were here now. Hard to believe I've come this far. Out of all of us that started together in the hundred, there isn't more than a few dozen left. All I can do now is just pray my luck holds out one more time. I had no idea what was going to happen to me. 23, 24, and 25. People got shot down the last mission. You never get it finished. The pilot, would, because he flew with somebody else, got shot down. It was just a, it, you know, you, you can't anticipate what's going to happen to you. There's no way of knowing. You were, you were lucky to finish.
known to the bomber boys, their primary mission is not to hit targets, but to attract the Luftwaffe. And the primary mission of the fighters is not to protect them, but to kill Germans. In this desperate battle of attrition, American commanders know that losses can no longer be a consideration. They will pay any price necessary to win. Even if it means sacrificing their precious bombers. I don't even know what to say. It's almost unbelievable. I made it. I'm still alive. Ending the 25 missions was the biggest deal I've ever had in my life. I was, I was finished, finished with the mission. The mission. I, was I was happy. Everybody congratulated. Everybody happy for you. And you're happy for yourself. That's about it. You didn't think about anybody else. Then. You think you have to be in this world. You have to be selfish. It's a very personal thing. It's something that, hey, you're alive. You're going to back to see your parents. You're going to see your mother and father. You're just thinking selfishly about yourself. No more worry, no more worrying about the, missing the target, no more worrying. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's a, it's a complete rel relieve yourself of all these anxiety you had before. I'm so happy. I mean, I'm thrilled. But at the same time, I'm also kind of numb. Looking around at what's left of the hundredth, it's a damn shame. But how the hell can anyone let this happen? And God only knows it's not even close to being over yet. Despite the tremendous losses, American fighters and air gunners destroy more than one-third of the attacking Luftwaffe, causing the 8th Air Force commanders to consider Big Week a success. They finally feel they have found an effective method for destroying the Luftwaffe. The most savage battle is yet to come. I wrote Dorothy last night, telling her about the guys I've been meeting. What a bunch of characters they all are. I told her that we've been having a lot of fun times, and that I've been playing a lot of card games and baseball. But most importantly, I told her everything is going well, and that she shouldn't worry at all, because I was sure I would see her again soon. I wonder now if I shouldn't have sent that letter. are shaking just trying to hold formation. I mean, Jesus, Berlin? Even the most experienced guys looked terrified when command said, this is where we were heading. Anybody, Anybody going into combat, combat if, if they, they don't, don't say they're, they're scared, scared, I don't think they're being honest. I knew I would be confronting combat, and I just hoped I was able to uh, Face the facts. Hope I had guts. Second Lieutenant John Gibbons has been assigned as a replacement B-17 pilot with the 100th Bombardment Group. Just weeks after arriving in England, he is already leading his crew into battle as part of a 15-mile-long parade of nearly 700 American bombers and fighters. 
D-Day is now less than three months away, and U.S. Army Air Commanders are desperate to bait and kill far more German fighters. To do this, they are attacking the one place Hitler will stop at nothing to defend, the German capital of Berlin. With Hitler himself bunkered in the city, it is the most dangerous mission yet attempted. Nearly 750 anti-aircraft gun emplacements surround Berlin. And more than 70% of the Luftwaffe fighters are stationed within combat range along the way. The bomber's route is intentionally designed to create a 400-mile-long battlefield, along which they hope to attract and destroy as many German fighters as possible. This is it. Time to focus straight ahead and get my crew through to the other side. As they close in on Berlin, more than 10,000 Luftwaffe gunners prepare to unleash the most heavily concentrated flak barrage the American airmen have ever seen. The fighters will not venture into the deadly flak field, but Gibbons and the bombers have no choice. To hit their targets, they must head directly over Berlin. You can already smell the cordite from the flak through our oxygen masks. God. My stomach's starting to churn. This is Berlin, for God's sake. They're gonna throw everything they got at us. But no matter what, we're hitting Hitler's town. And we're gonna drop our bombs right on that Nazi bastard's head. like the entire world is on fire. Like the whole thing could just rise up and consume us at any moment. There's nothing I can do except hold steady and pray I'll get through. Pray I'll see my family one more time. Pray I'll still be around when Dorothy receives that letter.
The United States Air Force has just completed the greatest aerial daylight operation of the war. A bulletin on the operations received within the hour says heavy bombers of the Much depends, of course, on how well the Germans can continue to stand up against the line air attacks. We have been described as a nation of weaklings, playboys, who would hire British soldiers or Russian soldiers or Chinese soldiers to do our fighting for us. Let them repeat that now. Barracks are empty. So many men are just gone. I barely even had time to learn their names. For John Gibbons and the men of the 100th, their Berlin raids are some of the costliest in bombardment group history. But they also mark the beginning of the end in the battle to defeat the Luftwaffe. Looking around at the guys' faces, there's sadness everywhere. But there's also a sort of grim determination. What we've gone through, it changes you. I know now that I can manage my crew and face whatever I meet in the skies. I'm part of the bloody hundredth now. threat severely diminished. The Allied air forces spend the next two months targeting railways, highways, and bridges in an effort to prevent the Germans from reinforcing the Normandy beaches on D-Day. This is what all fighter pilots dream about. There is no greater thrill than the thrill of the hunt. but I can't help thinking about what the bomber boys went through. For every one of us that becomes an ace, hundreds of them have suffered or died. War isn't about glory or being a hotshot. When I think about the war, I think about the guys that never made it home. Those guys, to me, they're the real heroes. All my friends who gave their lives, those are the guys I'll never forget. troops stormed the beaches of Normandy as planned. Luftwaffe resistance is minimal. They no longer have enough men and machines to effectively strike at the invasion force. Knowing that American soldiers are dying is heart-wrenching. But I also can't help but wonder, 
What would have happened if our airmen hadn't made the sacrifices they did? How many more dead would there be? In the months leading up to D-Day, the U.S. Army Air Forces in Europe suffered 18,400 casualties. But in the battle against the Luftwaffe, they accomplished the impossible. They took their newly established, inexperienced force and destroyed the most powerful aerial combat unit in the world. I will never forget my time with the 8th Air Force. The Air Force was certainly, was certainly one of the most important arms of war that the United States ever had. The Germans had to be defeated, and I think we were part of the defeat that was inflicted on them. I was glad to be a part of the army that defeated him. When I first heard about D-Day, I couldn't help but feel a surge of pride. We helped make that possible. We were carrying on a war before anyone else. It was something we were proud of. No matter what happens, you'll always remember your time in the war. There's a camaraderie. A friendship that you never forget. You may forget your missions, but you don't ever forget your friends.